Er holder et kontrast Er vi ud i deres land Da har ni skikhoi Gå kuhå Valen sjøslag Da har ik skikhoi You can't imagine how much we love this place. In summer, it can be close to paradise. But in winter, oh, it's another world. The wind can rip the door off a house. It howls like a banshee, ringing in your ears and making the sea boil. They say blasket is from a Viking word for a dangerous reef. To us, it's home. We've a name for everything. Every rock, every cove, every field. We call our island the Great Blasket. It's over three miles long and three quarters of a mile wide. With a mountain that shelters our little village from the power of the sea and the wind. That flat rock closest to us is Beginish. We used it to graze sheep. To the west is Inish Nabro, which has spires which fishermen call the Cathedral Rocks. Alongside that is the beautiful island of Inish Vikileoin. The northernmost island is Unish Tushkert. They say it looks like a sleeping giant. Further out still is Tirocht, a little piece of rock with a lighthouse. When people first took an interest in our world, it all seemed quite strange to us. Look, that's Mary and Kate and me. There we are with our teacher and our little schoolhouse. It's there we learnt so much about our past. There were people living here 2,000 years ago. After that, monks settled on all these islands. They came for the harsh remoteness of the place and felt it brought them closer to God. There's a prehistoric fort called Undun perched on the ridge and all the islands are scattered with ancient remains. There have been families living here since the 16th century. Our population dropped by a third after the Great Famine in the middle of the 19th century. But after that, life here was often better than on the mainland. The landlords didn't bother us as much, and the ocean provided for us a feast of fish. The most there's ever been here was 176 people. That was during the First World War. In those days, shipwrecks brought all sorts of things to our shores. Everything from wax to watches, timber, flour, meat and clothes. People came from all over Kerry to buy the stuff we didn't need ourselves. Once they found great wooden boxes of strange black leaves. They used them to feed the animals and dye their clothes. That was the first time they'd ever seen tea. And no one even thought of drinking it. Mostly life just rolled along, one year passing into the next. We all worked together. We had to milk the cows, tend the donkeys, take care of the sheep. There was always work to be done in the fields. Digging potatoes and turnips, or cutting oats and grass. We collected seaweed from the strand to put on the fields, and crabs and cockles to eat, and the men cut turf from the hill for the fire. 
Every June we all helped with shearing the sheep, bagging up the wool to sell it in Dingle, and some of the sheep were taken to the mainland by boat. And then there was the sea. We made our own boats, called Neavogues, with wooden frames covered in tar and canvas. They were very light, but with a strong crew they could be very fast and very manoeuvrable. They were our only link to the mainland. We used them to go everywhere, to church and hospital. The men caught lobster in summer to sell in Dingle, and pollock, and mackerel when the shoals were in. Boats went out as far as Tirach, and some days the men had to fight their way home, rowing against the wind as the storms rolled in. Everyone knew everyone on the island. It was like one big family. That's little Neof. One of the last girls born on the island. See that little doll on the wall? She loved that thing. And that's our island king. Pat's Vicky O'Cahoyne. To have a king was a custom on many Irish islands. He used to call himself the poorest king in the world. We had no shops, no doctor, no church, and only an unconsecrated burial ground. People went over to the mainland for mass most Sundays. Once a year, the priest would come over to say Mass in the schoolhouse. The post was our biggest treat of the week. The king, and later his son Sean, brought it from the mainland. Everyone gathered down at the harbour to see what had come from their relatives in America. We thought they lived like film stars over there. In their fancy clothes. They'd send us pictures and pocket money and tell stories of life in Springfield and Hartford. And all the young people dreamed about leaving, hoping to follow their brothers and sisters to America. We had days when the place was full of fun. On a Sunday, boats would come from all over and folk would dance and sing. Oh, it was such a joy. The place was full of music and laughter. Those summer days felt like they lasted forever. In the evenings, the whole village went up to the Doyle. That's old Mary's house in the upper village. Things could get scary. People told each other such stories about lost souls and spirits and banshees of men who crossed the ocean, guided by the ghosts of drowned sailors. And lots of really funny stories too. One of the old women, Peg Sayers, she knew hundreds of the stories, and she loved to tell them. The young ones would come running home in the dark with Peg's voice ringing in their ears. If the fairies don't claim you, they'll be back again tomorrow. He's the one that made us famous, Tommaso Crihin. His books brought people here in droves every summer, for as long as we can remember. Scholars from as far away as Norway came here to learn how we spoke in Irish. They'd spend weeks here, jotting down notes, sketching and taking photographs of just about everything. People like Robin Flower, George Thompson, John Millington Singh, Carl von Seedorf and Carl Marstrander. Look, that's one of me, just before we left. At first they had Tomás writing lists of our words for birds and flowers. Little by little his confidence grew and soon enough he was a real writer. He told me that it would be a pity for me to be idle like the poet Dunleavy long ago and that I should write a few books so that I'd be alive when I'm dead. Before long he was writing whole books. 
of our life here and the stories we told. And then many more books came from people like Peg and Moorish O'Sullivan, as many as two dozen books by islanders. We all knew they could tell a good story. But those books took our lives and our stories around the world. Translated into English, French, German, Spanish, even Swedish. But all of that wasn't enough to keep us going. The people just drained away. More and more young people headed to America. And life here just seemed to get harder. One winter, things got so bad, we had to ask for help. I listened to a tree of a hand, I did a keg of a tree of a woman. Shakto Rocky had the Dina Norga Roga, sir. I did a keg of a tree. And the other one, yes, I'm going to have the Nugget's first two of us to hand to the Nurse and Sarah Sarah Coga down the South America. You haven't done that too long, I would. Today the island still has its magic. There are people from all over the world that drop in, just to breathe that air and feel the beauty of the place. Some have read the Blasket books and want to see the place for themselves. And the old connections are still there. Some families keep a house, and others mind the sheep. And the seals are still there, more now that there are fewer people to bother them. And the air is still alive with birds, puffins, gannets, sheer waters, ravens, fulmers. There's really nowhere quite like it. I have written minutely of much that we did, for it was my wish that somewhere there should be a memorial for it all. And I have done my best to set down the character of the people about me so that some record of us will live after us, for the likes of us will never be again. <laughs> 